Welcome to Magic Arcanum, I'm Ryan Gomez. Behind the scenes is Nicole Burdick, and we're so glad you're here because it's story time! March of the Machine gives us a front row seat for the Phyrexian invasion of the multiverse, but even with a whopping 10 main story chapters and 20 story spotlight cards, a lot of characters and locations only get explored in the additional side stories. Today, I'm going to recap all eight of these adventures so you know what else happens in March of the Machine. But first, why don't you equip yourself for the journey by visiting our sponsor for this video, Into the AM. If you've got a favorite magic plane or character, they have got a graphic tee with the style to match, and they're the best fitting and most comfortable shirts you'll ever wear. Use promo code MAGICARCANUM and you'll even save 10% site-wide. And that stacks with their bundles, which are a great way to convoke some drip into your collection. Check out Into the AM using the link down below and you'll be supporting the show while turning yourself into the best-dressed wizard at your next game night. Alright, now let's take a look at what else happens in March of the Machine. The first side story takes place on Arcavios, and it's called A Radiant Heart. The invasion is already underway. Many of the Strixhaven faculty members have been completed, which poses a danger to the students, and that's before they're given a task by Liliana. That's right, Liliana has returned to the plane to watch over the students and do whatever she can to protect them. She has built up a pretty secure wall of defenses around one of the dorms, but she knows it won't hold forever, so she sends a group out on a little mission. The team is the legendary students from the Strixhaven set, including Quint, Dina, Killian, Rutha, and Zimone. Liliana wants them to slip into the Biblioplex, the school's massive library, and locate a spell. It's called the Invocation of the Founders, and it's the original magic used by the Plains' five elder dragons to create the school of Strixhaven. Liliana believes replicating the spell will repair the damage done so far and basically expel the Phyrexian invaders because they weren't part of the vision when the school was founded. So Quint and his friends make their way past a bunch of Phyrexianized professors and locate the spell and they combine their respective magics to cast it. This causes Quint's spark to ignite, which makes him randomly planeswalk away, and so without him there to complete his portion of the spell, it is only mostly successful. Even so, that's enough to push back the invading Phyrexians and give Liliana and the other students the breathing room they need to survive, because as we know from the main story, the Phyrexian oil eventually gets rendered inert, which ends the danger to the plane. Zimone and Dina do combine their powers at one point. Dina grows a tree to break through part of the roof, and Zimone multiplies the growth factor so that they're able to do it fast enough to escape the chasing Phyrexians. Quint also does summon some spirits out of some statues within the school, which we've seen him do before, and I like how the invasion of Arcavios leads right to the invocation of the Founders, which seems just as powerful as it does in the story. Overall, this was a pretty tight side story. Strixhaven is one of my favorite sets, and Quint is an interesting character that I am excited to see become a planeswalker. The second side story takes us to Ikoria, and it's called Survival of the Fittest. Things open with Jarena Kudro leading a group of survivors who are fleeing the destroyed city of Dranith and hoping to reach Lava Brink before they are caught by Luca. Luca has come to the plane to oversee the Phyrexian invasion, and he's been sort of absorbing creatures here, literally mutating himself into a colossal monster that is now slowly closing in on the humans caught out in the open. Standing between them is Vivian, who has partnered up with Cheville, one of the plane's premier monster hunters. Together, they set a trap for Luca made out of a bunch of buried mines, but it barely slows Luca down, so Vivian is forced to switch tactics. Meanwhile, Jarena leads the survivors into a nearby canyon, implying that the narrow pass will protect them from Luca, 
even though it will greatly delay them from reaching the safety of Lava Brink. Luca is able to chase the humans into the canyon, however, and people think they are now trapped, when Jarena reveals her real plan. This is actually the nesting ground of Vadrock, one of Ikoria's apex monsters who doesn't take kindly to Luca's presence. Vadrock attacks Luca and eventually melts him with a breath weapon. The humans are glad to have lived, but they're kind of mad at Jarena for using them as bait. But she's like, that's Ikoria, baby. You do what you gotta do to survive. So, the invasion of Ikoria shows how the monsters of the plane mutated their own resistance to the Phyrexian oil and were thus able to fight back, but Zillortha himself never appeared in the side story. As for Luca, his defeat is shown on tandem takedown, and thanks to Vadrock's actions, the story makes it quite clear he was literally melted into nothing, so there is no chance he survived. Next, we jump over to Ixalan for 300 steps under the sun. The planeswalker Huatli has a daring plan for defending her home, but she is short on troops to pull it off. This forces her to cut a deal with Mavrin and his vampires, who were rotting away in a dungeon, but you know what desperate times call for. Together, Huatli and Mavrin lead their mixed forces into Arazka, where they intend to summon the plane's elder dinosaurs and set them loose against the invading Phyrexians. Mavrin and the others hold the ground floor as Huatli climbs 300 stone steps to a ritual tower, and from there she says a magical prayer meant to summon the dinosaurs. Meanwhile, the vampires and Sun Empire forces are attacked by Atali, or what's left of Atali, who has already fallen to Phyrexian corruption. They are saved by the timely intervention of Zetalpa, and then the other elders appear out of the surrounding jungle, including the great three-headed Zakama, who delivers the killing blow to Atali. Galta is also there, but Mavrin doesn't get to ride him. Instead, the vampires have to be content with earning their freedom thanks to the deal they cut with Huatli, but she's just grateful she'll live to have another date night with Sahili, now that the Phyrexians are getting chomped up by her dinosaur buddies. Over on Innistrad, things get a little darker as we get to enjoy family game night. Gisa and Geralf trade letters back and forth, taunting each other as they each deal with the invading Phyrexians their own way. We learn that the Phyrexian oil only works on a living mind, and so Gisa's zombies are immune to infection. Geralf is at a slight disadvantage because he can't stitch together fallen Phyrexians and he knows the oil could infect him, so he doesn't want to touch those bodies anyway. The siblings make a game out of this and challenge each other to be the savior of Havengul, but eventually they team up and reanimate a massive sea creature which is able to chase away the remaining Phyrexians. After defeating the invasion forces, they go right back to bickering over who is the more capable of the two, because some things are beyond even Phyrexia's ability to change. This one was pretty fun. Having the story develop mostly through letters back and forth between the siblings gave it a different vibe, and their respective styles of zombies each added something unique to the conflict with the Phyrexians. Curiously absent, though, are Thalia and the Gitrog monster, the featured legendary team-up for this plane, but they don't appear anywhere in this side story or the main one. We also don't hear anything about Sorin or Arlen, and don't you dare ask about Emrakul, or I will scour you from existence myself. <clears throat> the Adventures of Rankle, Master of Love, brings us over to Eldraine, and it is entirely about Chulane, my world champion card. Hmm? Okay, okay, I kid. It's mostly about Rankle, though Chulane does appear and he gets some rocks thrown at him, probably because he asked about Emrakul. Tulane tries to warn everyone about the impending invasion, because apparently he's the only one who realizes the sky has become all messed up, and so he goes to speak with Ayara, all while being followed by the mischievous Rankle. Rankle sees Ayara and immediately falls in love and decides he wants to marry her. He just needs to find a way to get her to notice him first. So he goes into the forest to find ingredients for a love potion, but gets attacked by a Phyrexian converter beast. He is saved by Torbran, 
who says that Kenrith's have fallen, but he has a plan, and he will need Rankle's help. He thinks fate put them together for a reason. Rankle notices Torbran is carrying a magical wishing ring, and he steals it off him. The fairy then wishes for a basket of cookies and a love potion to use on Ayara, before realizing she's already become a Phyrexian. Torbran begs Rankle to give him the ring back, as it is their only hope to stop these abominations, and Rankle says, hey, watch it, those are my future subjects you're talking about. Rankle then uses the last wish in the ring to make it rain love potion, just as a big hole opens up in the ground. He flies above it, and all the Phyrexians come running at him and fall into the hole. Rankle himself then falls in, happy to be the master of love, and then an enchanted sleep washes over him and all of the Phyrexians in the hole with him. It's a very funny story, and it gives Rankle a lot of great lines while advancing the situation on Eldraine, which is important because we'll be going there later this year. And we know the invasion had some serious impacts, so I'm curious to see how that all gets dealt with. Rankle and Torbrand don't exactly fight side by side, but they do work together, and thus their team-up card from the set is one of the few to show something that really happened in the story. From there, we hop over to Ravnica for one and the same, told almost entirely from the fractured point of view of Vraska. I say fractured because a part of her personality has hidden itself away in the protected section of her mind created by Jace during the Ixalan story. So Vraska is able to watch from inside as her completed self enacts all sorts of horrors across Ravnica. Mostly, she has the Golgari completed first and then used as her personal shock troops. She tells them to go for the eyes and they rapidly disfigure the citizens of Ravnica. Now blinded, those helpless souls reach out in pain, only to find the streets are soaked in oil. It's pretty gruesome, and Vraska feels terrible about it, but she cannot stop herself from doing it. She's mostly a passenger in her own body at this point, but before she can find a way out, she is confronted by Ral Zarek. Ral, ever creative, has devised a weapon that basically boils the oil within Vraska, and it's so effective, it apparently leaves behind no body. But as she dies, she has a fantasy encounter with Jace. They apologize to each other for their faults, kiss like crazy, and generally enjoy the life they should have had were it not for the Phyrexians ruining everything. This is all in Vraska's head, though. Jace isn't really there. It's just her last thoughts as her body is vaporized by Ral's weapon. Or is it? I think the story wants us to believe it's possible Vraska escaped, as the uncorrupted part of her mind planeswalked her away at the last moment, but it seems to be deliberately vague. So I encourage you to read the story yourself and leave me your thoughts in the comments. This was another well-composed side story, and it features one of my favorite magic characters of all time, so I was caught up in it. But for anyone wondering, no, we do not see Borborygmos and Fibblethip. We don't even see the completed Jace, just Vraska's mental image of him as she remembers him in happier times. Side Story 7 takes us to New Capenna for the fall of Park Heights. Arendt, the street artist, is working with an assortment of resistance fighters from across the various families, including Perry and Henzi. Together, they come up with a plan to crush Atraxa with part of the city itself. Arendt, being the most nimble of the group, is tasked with sneaking past the Phyrexians and into an area featuring a key structural support for Park Heights. To help her with this, an angel named Della grants her some halo, which she mixes with paint in her airbrush gun. Well, she uses it like a gun. She also makes some Halo paint bombs and then uses them to great effect as she works her way into the underbelly of Park Heights, where she finally sets and then detonates the supplied explosive charges. This causes Park Heights to come crashing down on top of Atraxa, killing her, exactly as we saw in the main story. This just gives us a bit more context and shows some of the work that went into making it happen. 
Uh, I'll be honest, New Capenna, one of my least favorite planes maybe ever. And this was one of the weaker side stories. We don't see Giada and Errant team up, but we do learn Angelo is Errant's father, and he gets completed. So there is a bit of drama there, but it lands flat. Atraxa dying is an important event because it frees up the angels to go save the rest of the multiverse, but it also shows them here as being a little annoyed people have been squandering their halo all these years, and the crime families are like, well, what are you going to do about it? The last side story is on Zendikar, and it's called Battles in the Field and in the Mind. Nahiri has returned home, and she is eager to set the plane right. She's angry at herself for failing to stop the Eldrazi, and for letting Nyssa best her in becoming Zendikar's guardian. So she channels all of that rage into the Phyrexian invasion. She decides to set up base in the Ameria Skyclave, where she turns herself into a keystone and uses her increased powers to move hedrons around or something, but it doesn't really say why that matters. Still, she considers it a success, and the Phyrexians do manage to conquer Seagate, so things are going pretty well for them. That changes, however, when Linvala, Akiri, Tazri, Aura, and Kaza make their way to the Skyclave to confront Nahiri. The adventure party fights their way past the corrupted elementals that guard the hallways of the massive floating city, and then they reach Nahiri deep inside. There is a big fight, and it looks like they're going to lose until Linvala starts glowing brightly, and so does the halo around Tazri's neck. This sudden surge of energy lets them overpower Nahiri, but removing her from the keystone position causes the whole skyclave to start breaking apart. Our heroes flee to safety, but Nahiri falls to the ground, crushed within the ruins of the skyclave. So this was another one where not much really happens. I guess we're supposed to accept that Linvala and Tazri had access to the same halo magic as the angels of New Capenna, but the story doesn't outright say that. Omnath does not appear, and Linvala doesn't team up with Drana. She's not in the story at all, although I guess it is possible they meet up later, after Nahiri is defeated. We never see her body, though. And that's it. Those are the side stories for March of the Machine. I found some of them to be quite good, with my favorites probably being Vraska on Ravnica and Rankle on Eldraine. But uh, some of them were clearly filler, like New Capenna and Zendikar, and it's fine if you still like those stories. I enjoy spending time with my favorite characters and locations too. I just would prefer it if they advanced things in a meaningful way, or at least connected to the cards in the set a little better. The biggest misses to me, though, are probably the lack of any real story on Theros, where the gods were being completed under the watchful eye of a Johnny. At one point in the main story, Elspeth notes three of the gods have been corrupted, but the card for Afara makes it sound like eventually all five of the monocolored ones fall. Perhaps the Aftermath expansion will give us a definitive answer. I also want to confirm we don't get anything set on Tarkir, even though we've got a few legendary cards from there, and we don't go back to Dominaria, so I can't tell you what Rona is up to. Galissa is also notably absent, as is Tezzeret, though again, I think we'll get more information about him in the aftermath, because he is going to be relevant in future stories, while Galissa is probably just phased out of existence along with the rest of New Phyrexia. In total, March of the Machine has 36 battle cards depicting the Phyrexian invasion across various planes, and these side stories take us to eight of them. It's a nice little tour around the multiverse, but I think some of that time should have been spent on Kaldheim, where apparently they burned their own world tree to keep it out of Phyrexian hands. And that doesn't happen anywhere in the written story. We also don't know what happened with Jace. In the main story, he just excuses himself from the room while Elish Norn is handing out assignments to the other planeswalkers. We are told Jace is smart enough to already know what she expects from him, but we're never told what that is or where he's going. 
I would have liked one more story set on New Phyrexia, but maybe from the Phyrexian side of things, with Glissa or Ixhel or Skrelv just showing what they were going through as Norn pushed the invasion and their world started to crumble around them. March has some very cool cards, and the scope of everything feels epic. The story tries to match this by showing us battles happening in familiar places, but it's never quite brave enough to show us something new, or to linger on characters long enough to see them really struggle. Even in that side story on Zendikar, there is a moment when Aura touches oil, and then his hand starts to get completed. But Linvala starts glowing like a Christmas tree, and all the oil in the room evaporates, and Aura is apparently cured. Even though in the new Capenna story, the angel Della tells us Halo is only a protective measure. It cannot cure you once you are infected by the oil. Halo is the face mask that prevents you from getting sick, not the medicine you take after. Not like we haven't all spent the last three years becoming experts in that. Anyway, the side stories did help give us some texture to the invasion, but I'm really looking forward to the aftermath expansion answering the lingering questions this massive event left us with. But what about you? Which side story was your favorite? Let me know down in the comments, check out my link for Into the AM while you're there, and make sure you like this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the great stories you'll only find here on Magic Arcanum. We'll see ya!